Why, hello there! Where we last left off in Chapter 6, um, our heroes had just escaped the thieves. The thieves were trying to steal money for them in early morning, and they realized it, hatched a plan, and escaped. So today, we're going to dive into Chapter 7. <clears throat> The next morning, the weather cleared, and by the end of the fourth day, the spires of Oxford appeared. Before long, they crossed the cheerwell into the high street. Everywhere Robin looked, there were students walking about or talking on street corners. So here we have a modern-day picture of Oxford. And this is probably more what it looked like back then. So before, after huge changes, and here are the students walking the streets. They filled the punts and barges that crowded the two rivers. They sprawled under the park trees, eating bread and cheese, but wherever they were, they talked and talked and talked. Most of the students were poor and were dressed in every sort of party-colored gown or tunic. It seems to me, said Robin, as if they tried to see how outlandish they can make themselves look. The travelers went up the high then turned on past the Saxon Tower and the Market Cross to St. John's College, where they, they were received with courtesy and where they spent the night. Beyond Oxford, the country began to be more rolling, meaning there was more rolling hills. Sometimes the road led through forests, then again it ran beside the river, crossed a bridge, and went up through a village. Once they had to turn aside and allow the calf... Cal Cade, man, that is a tough word, of horsemen to pass. Well, tough with an accent. <laughs> it's, it's swept by in a fine parade of shining mail, bright banners, and gaily carpersoned horses. In their midst rode a lady with her attendants. Robin wished the lady had been his mother. Where was his mother now? Did she know about him and where he was? Did she know that he walked with the help of crutches? They followed the cavalcade up the winding road to the top of the hill where there was a sign announcing a fair at Wick, Wick would be. There will be jousting, said Robin. There will be dancing, said John Go in the Wind. And there will be little praying, said Brother Luke. There will be no room at the inn, so we must not linger long. Let us See a little fun, begged Robin. So here Brother Luke doesn't want to stop. They want to keep going since there will be little praying. And Robin is begging, can we please go to the fair? So they turned aside and spent some hours at the fair, tethering the horses near the gate and giving a penny to a lad for watching them. All the country people had come from miles around. They had brought cattle and sheep dairy butter, cheese, whatever had their portion after giving what was due to the lord of the manor. Lombards from Europe were there, with goods from far-off lands. There were silks and velvets from Italy and France, laces from Flanders. Robin wanted to be everywhere at once. He wanted to watch the tournament, the bear baiting, the wrestling, and the racing. He wanted to taste all the food, the pigeon pies. Mmm! The honey tots, the suckling pig with the apple in its mouth, and the jugged hair. He flitted from one booth to the other, and Brother Luke after him. So, bear baiting was a popular sport back then. Basically, the bear would wrestle and fight other animals. So there's a picture of that. So that's one of the things they saw at the fair. And then some of the delicious, delicious, not really food, is pigeon pie and the suckling pig. You've probably seen suckling pigs in some of the cartoons, but that was a real thing from medieval times. Yummy, yummy food, right? <laughs> Let's continue. Finally, Brother Luke said, hast, hast seen enough, lad? It is a good way to the next hospice, they tell me, and we have two or three journey, days' journey ahead of us. So come, my son. Let me only... Let me see only the rest of Punch and Judy, then, agreed Robin, and I shall be willing, for never have I seen anything so funny. So in your book, you can see a picture 
So Punch and Judy is a puppet show that they had at the medieval fair. Um, these were marionettes. And so Robin's saying, I've never seen something so funny. Like, let me finish this episode. Yes, we could call it for back then. For that only, then, said the friar, and went to find John, who had been playing tunes and earning a few extra farthings from the dancers. By night of that day, they reached an abbey set in a hollow. Its square tower stood above the trees in its sign of welcome to the travelers, who were most grateful for the hospitality of the abbot. And so here we have an abbey. This is modern-day abbey, um, but this is just a picture of what it would be like back then because these sorts of abbeys and their, ele and their elegance did exist um, in medieval times as well, and they're still, some are still standing today. He told them of the best road to their destination and of the deep wood through which they would pass. There was frost on the ground where they started out next day. They had been a week on their journey, and according to the abbot's counsel, they had still two days or more to go. Great rolling hills began to appear, and over them hung clouds filled with rain. And rain it did before the hour was out. Then, when they had begun to enter the wood that embraced the hill, it slackened and the sun came out. Let us halt here for a midday food, so we're going to stop for lunch said John, whose jerkin was wet because his cloak had been left hanging out the window of the white hot. Here I shall build a fire to warm us and dry our clothes. Let us hope we are not overtaken by marauding Welsh, said the friar hopefully, for we are at the border. We shall see the office to remind us in whose care we are here as well as everywhere. So they're worried about thieves coming since they're at the border, um, but the friar is reminding them that God is in control. God will take care of them. He's here with us right now, and he's here everywhere we go. They knelt in the woods as if it had been a cathedral, as indeed it looked to be, for the trees, bare of leaves, arched overhead in the same way that the groined arches of stone swept up high overhead in the Gothic churches. Maybe that is where the idea came from, thought Robin. So they're in the woods and they see these trees, and I love the way that the author describes this. They see these trees that create these arches, similar to a Gothic church. So this is our Gothic church, and the trees are just overlapping each other. So imagine that this is a forest rather than a church. And Robin says, I wonder if that's where they got the idea for the architecture of the Gothic churches, meaning they looked at nature and saw how the trees overlapped and hung over to create an arch and a walkway. And so then they copied that in the Gothic churches. Interesting. The fire felt comforting and warm. There was no ale and only one withered apple left. Yum. But water flowed in the river hard by, from which John filled the leather flagons. After they had eaten, John sang a ballad while he dried his clothes. When Robin asked if he might try the harp, John showed him how to hold it and pluck the strings. But it was not as easy as it appeared. John promised to teach him. By all accounts, said Brother Luke, this forest goeth for miles, and it may well be that we shall not come out of it by nightfall. Now I remember this wood, said John, nodding his head, though it was but once I went through it. It is of great size, and there is a woodman's college, or cottage, sorry, there is a woodman's cottage, I recall, wherein we can shelter for the night. I found the woodman and his good wife, courteous and kindly folk, willing to share what they have. Let us be on our way, said Robin, now that we are near to our journey's end. I wish to see my godfather, Sir Peter de Lindsay. Think you he is a good man, as my father says, John go in the wind? Will he want me to, to will he want me now to stay with him? For how shall I be an esquire or even a page? Robin was thoughtful. Here we have squires and page. This is a reenactment, um, but remember these are like the apprentices of knights, which is Robin's ultimate goal is to become a knight. It is well known in the country round about that he is a gracious master and a noble knight, said John. His lady, too, is well loved for her goodness to the poor. Fear not, my son, the friar assured him. Thou 
find kind friends in thy new home. All afternoon the way continued through the forest, yet there was no sign of its coming to an end. The dusk began to fall, and the howl of a wolf sent shivers down Robin's spine. Still no woodman's hut appeared, and there was naught but forest trees and brush on every hand. So there's forest and trees everywhere they look. Finally, when it was so dark they could hardly see the path, Robin pointed out a feeble light. See there, through the trees, he said, a small cottage, that must be the place. Ah, John sighed in relief. Then I was not mistaken. It is the woodman's college where we shall lodge. Cottage, I keep saying college. It is the woodman's cottage where we shall lodge tonight. How welcome the hearth and the fire will be, declared Brother Luke. Let us hope we shall be as welcome. By my faith, if we are not welcome, then the surf is an ingrate. And so here they're saying, you know, if we're not welcomed, then they are ungrateful. An ingrate is an ungrateful person back in medieval times. For when I passed this way before, I helped yon woodman bind up the wound he'd gotten from a fallen axe. Then I carried him on my back to the back to the court where the woman tended him. The woodcutter and his wife made them welcome and shared gladly what they had. The ale was well brewed, and there was peas porridge and bread for supper. Then John played the little harp and sang. The next morning, well refreshed, the three voyagers set out on the last leg of their journey. The weather was neither fair nor rainy, neither hot nor cold nor cold, but somewhere in between, as English weather is like to be, said the friar. When true daylight arrived, they had come to the edge of the wood, and now the hills stood all about, being very high toward the north, where the Welsh mountains loomed in the blue distance. For the most part, the road lay low among the hills, winding in and out following the river. A heavy mist hung over the valley, so thick it was like a white blanket which parted, only enough for the next step to be seen, then closed again. When wayfarers were met, it was as if they appeared by magic out of nowhere. Once, where the road was narrow and a group of peasants suddenly came out of the midst and stopped to ask their way. Their speech was very strange to Robin, but John Go in the wind seemed to know what they said, for he directed them in the same strange tongue. They are Welsh, he explained, and have wandered out of their way in the fog. My mother was Welsh, so I know some of the words. There is much trouble with the Welsh along the border here, but these seem like harmless folk. Late in the afternoon, a breeze suddenly sprang up. In a few moments, the mists the mists lifted and the air cleared. Robin looked up in amazement, for there, rising high against the raising clouds, stood a town with a church tower and castle complete. It must be. It was Lindsay. Look, he cried. Look, there it is. We have arrived. Tis true, agreed John. Tis as I hoped. We have arrived before sundown and can enter the castle before the gate is closed. Now thanks be to him who guided us aright, said Brother Luke devoutly, blessing himself. Lindsay is sure it is surely, said John, for only Lindsay stands so on a mound ranged with hills like a pudding and a saucer. We've but to cross yon bridge, go up the hill and through the town gate, and we are there. From the market cross tis but a step to the castle gate. It is a happy end to our journey. Beyond the town and castle lives my own mother. They crossed the bridge and started up the hill. Now that he was so near to the destination, Robin dreaded the meeting with Sir Peter. What sort of welcome would he have, limping as he was on crutches? What sort of page could he be, having no free hands for service? So remember, a page is an assistant to a knight is sort of like the apprentice. Robin need not have been afraid. As soon as they had passed through the outer gate, a messenger went swiftly ahead of the travelers to announce them. 
The drawbridge was down, and the gate opened to them without question, and they were received in the great hall, as if they had been emissaries of the king. And so emissaries are sort of like ambassadors, so um, it's for diplomatic purposes. So an ambassador is somebody from a different country that comes to kind of make negotiations, make sure everything's peaceful, and so the king is welcoming them like their own. Ambassadors are close to royalty um, in medieval times, and so they're treated with the highest honors and respect. Sir Peter was scarcely recovered from his wounds. He sat in a high-backed chair near the fire, while Lady Constance sat at her embroidery frame, with a small girl leaning at her knee. Nearby were her ladies and two little boys who romped with the hounds. So the two little boys were playing with the dogs. How cute! When the travellers entered the hall, Lady Constance rose, and drawing the children about her, stood beside Sir Peter to greet them. It is a true pleasure to welcome you into our household, said Sir Peter to Robin, not seeming to notice that Robin could not straighten. We are grateful to this good friar for his care of you, and to John Go in the Wind, who is known to us. This is Lady Constance and our daughter Alison, and these are my two sons, Henry and Richard. So, uh, just to pause for a second. So it's, it mentions that Sir Peter doesn't notice that he is not straight. And so the question that we're faced with is, do you think that Sir Peter honestly does not notice Robin on crutches, or does it not matter to him? And I would argue that it is the second one that doesn't matter to him, but Robin thinks he hasn't noticed yet. Lady Constance warmly embraced Robin, crutches and all. We have long awaited your coming, dear child, and now we are most happy that you have safely arrived. I shall make a sorry page, my lady, said Robin ruefully, which means sadly. But I can sing, and I can read a little, to while away the time for your lordship, he offered. I, and I can pen letters for you. So Robin is offering other things that he can do since he thinks he won't be able to be a page um, to the night. Sir Peter kept Robin's hand in his and spoke directly to him. Each of us has his place in the world, he said. If we cannot serve in one way, there is always another. If we do what we are able, and a door opens to something else. And this is a very, very important quote. Sir Peter is reaffirming Robin that even though he might not be of service in one way, there is another way that he can serve because there's always a door to something else, right? And that's something that's alluded to throughout the book, thus the title, Door in the Wall. There it was again, Robin thought, a door. He wondered whether Sir Peter meant the same thing that Brother Luke had intended. Could you imagine everybody talking to you about a door? And if you take it figured, or if you take it literally, it could be very confusing. So this book uses a lot of figurative language, meaning Robin has hit this wall in his life, and being on crutches is a huge, um, he views it as a huge disservice to him. But they're encouraging him to find another way. Each of the travelers were assigned to his own place. Robin was to have his chamber in the keep. The friar was to be lodged in a little room over the chapel in the inner ward of the castle, and John Go in the wind was given quarters over the outer entrance gate. Before leaving the hall, he asked a favor. By your leave, he said, I would like to visit my old mother, who lives not far away. But I shall stay here a while until my young master finds his way about. Now that he was well received, Robin found everything about Lindsay exciting and interesting. The view from the top of the keep where they went in the morning was breathtaking. I can see for miles in every direction, he said excitedly. Surely no enemy could attack without being seen by the watch. And this, my friends, is foreshadowing. <sighs> Didst forget the fog? asked John Go in the wind, who had accompanied him. And look yonder, said Adam, the bowman, who stood watch that day. See that tiny moving spot in the field? At first, Robin could not find anything that moved in the open field to which Adam pointed. Then he was justable. 
to make out the figure of a shepherd in a flock of sheep. After a great deal of Adam's directing and pointing, he could see a woodcutter emerging from the trees by the river. By night, or under the cover of mists, said Adam, a whole army could creep over the hill through the forest without being seen. Tis from the north and west that we look for trouble. Lord Jocelyn to the west hath long coveted this domain, and Sir Hugh Fitzhugh, <laughs> that's a funny name, to the north yonder, who is the cousin to Sir Peter, hath a quarrel with him. And so they're pointing out all these people that want to take over the land. So we have Lord Jocelyn, who has always wanted the land, and then we have Sir Hugh Fitzhugh, that name makes me laugh every time, um, <laughs> Sir Hugh Fitzhugh, who has a quarrel with Sir Peter, and so he might want to attack just to kind of um, get revenge. And all of this, my dear friends, is foreshadowing. But they could not take so strong castle, surely, said Robin. We can be starved out, said Adam, meaning that they might not be able to attack us fully, but they sure can block us from getting any food. And then eventually we'll be overtaken because we'll be hungry and starving. From the other side of the tower, Robin could look down upon the town and the church roof and see clearly how the church was shaped like a cross. He could see the roof of the market cross in the open square and the people walking about. He could see the bend of the river and the two bridges, one leading west and one to the south, where they had crossed yesterday. To the north the ground fell straight away down to the river, more than a hundred feet below. My mother's cottage is there, said John, pointing north, over the hill and into the next valley. Robin could see where the tower of the village church showed above the trees. Beyond, he could see the manor house against a dark forest which crowned the hills far, far away. Is it near to the village where yon church tower stands? asked Robin. Aye, tis just there, this side of the church, and a tidy bit, a tidy bit of a house on the heath where she lives alone with her cat. There is a, there is a path all the way. If thou to call upon her, she would bake thee a bannock. Robin repeated the directions, but laughed at the thought of going all that way to make a visit. Go you by that road I see leading up the river here? he asked again. No, said John, for tis a long way round by Lethem Bridge. I go through the town and by the drover's road, road and across the ford beyond. It was, a more it was more difficult for Robin to go down the circular stair from the top of the keep than it was, or than it had been, to go up. Each step was set on a center newel, and the steps found out from it. Robin had to keep to the outside wall to allow room for the crutches to spread far enough to bear his weight. John went ahead of him to catch him in case he should fall. So Robin is really struggling with the staircases. Now, they probably didn't have as elegant banisters back then, the railings, but it's saying that he had to keep to where the stairs were the widest, so along the wall here. And could you imagine, like, climbing these without crutches is a feat in and of itself, but with crutches, that would be extremely difficult. And this proves to be a challenge for Robin as the story goes on. I shall get the way of it soon, said Robin, meaning I'll get the hang of it soon. Before the day was out, he found it easier. They had gone up and down, stair after stair, up to the watchtowers and the belfry of the chapel, to the kitchens and storerooms, to the armory, and down to the dungeons. Then John took Robin to the stables to see the horses. There were dappled percherins from France, and shire geldings of tremendous size built to bear the weight of men in armor. They, there were lighter animals for hunting, hawking, and riding, and others still smaller like the genet Robin had ridden. Robin thought the gray one looked like his father's favorite. How he wished he might ride it, going astride properly as he should. Would he ever again be able to mount a horse? Would he be able to practice in the tilting yard or go a-hawking? Would he ever stand straight and tall? 
So Robin's here wondering, you know, can I ever mount a horse? A knight needs to be able to ride a horse. Well, can I do that? Well, can I even go hunting? Can I even stand straight? Last of all, they went to the workshop near the stables. There were u bows there the u bows were made and repaired, staffs for lances and pike staffs were cut. So here we have some weaponry, that's what they're describing. So staffs for lances, pike staffs that were cut, and we're gonna get to that next picture soon. Such small things as plates, cups, bowls, and platters were made by the turners in the town. Arrows were made by the Fletchers. It is here we shall make our little harp, said John. Can we make it soon? asked Robin. We shall begin it tomorrow if I can find the wood, promised John. As soon as Robin was settled in the household of the castle, he was taken in hand again by Brother Luke, who laid out a plan of study and recreation for him that would fit in with the duties assigned him as page. Sir Peter had explained that he would expect Robin to attend to everything which it is possible, which it was possible for him to do. Part of each day was spent with Adam the Yeoman shooting at a mark. Part of the day was studying Latin. Evenings after supper, the household servants, pages, craftsmen, and all those not on watch gathered among, gathered about the fire in the great hall where Pierce Nightingale or John told tales or sang ballads. Each day, the friar took Robin down the long path to the river to swim. The water was cold as ice and swift flowing. But now Robin had learned to grit his teeth and plunge in. It should have been one of his duties to serve at the high table where Sir Peter and the Lady Constance sat with other members of the family and visiting nobles. But it was so difficult for him to carry things. He was excused from that and was required only to see that his lady was well looked after and that the little boys were helped with the cutting of their meat and breaking off the bread for sopping. So sopping is where you dip the bread into, like, the soup. One of the hounds that searched for bones among the straw litter learned to come to Robin for tidbits, seeming to know that he had found a special friend. Robin was careful to find bones from the joint with juicy bits of meat still clinging to them, and soon he was Robin's friend. So here Robin is feeding the dog scraps underneath the table, and he's made a friend through it. He even slept by Robin's bed instead of the fire in the hole where the other dog with the other dogs and followed him everywhere. His name was Daff, because he had been brought from a town in Flanders of that name. So Robin names his dog. Now he has a dog, he has a friend. He names his dog Daff, since that is where he came from. And that, my friend, 